And it might sound a little bit um, unnecessary to say this, but it's very easy to get dehydrated. I myself was dehydrated last summer. Um, I was just like, everything was aching. I could barely get off the couch. I just felt really nauseous. Turns out I hadn't drank enough water uh, while, while by riding my bike outdoors um, in the summer. So, you know, it really, it happens. It can be dangerous. You may not know what it is. So just, you know, take these precautions so that your situation doesn't end up being even worse, even more uncomfortable, and, and you don't end up in the, in the hospital. Um, I know folks are seeing issues with fuel, so long lines at gas stations, um, and the main, the main point here, I really want to encourage people not to panic. Uh, we can get through this, okay? If you are medically fragile, if you are not being able to tolerate the heat, you can call us. If it's not urgent, you can call 211 and a team will connect with you and they they've been doing wellness checks um all day and and they'll go out there they'll see what you need they'll transport you somewhere cool if that's the answer they'll help you refill your oxygen or whatever it is that you need um they will help you with if it's an emergency of course you can call 911 and so as long as you take care of yourself watching out for dehydration not being outside for too long um and uh, taking care when driving because there are those tree limbs there are those power lines then we can do our part of responding we have had um, several uh, senior living facilities that are without power request that kind of help and so um, so so it is very uncomfortable but it does not have to be dangerous if we all control it so that's another reason why the fuel situation you know it's scary but we can we can handle this. Um, we can't control exactly when those gas stations are going to get fuel back or power back. So the ones that don't have power, they can't supply the fuel. And the ones that do have fuel are seeing uh, limitations because everybody's going there. So so just don't panic and um, and then remember to be courteous. Only take when, what you need. If you do manage to get to the front of the line in one of the gas stations that has fuel and the ability to um, to distribute it. So if you have a um, eight, five gallon cans for your generator, you know, don't fill them all. Just be thoughtful about the fact that there are hundreds of thousands of families that are facing the same issue. With grocery stores, they're doing everything they can to provide for the community. So also um, gratitude for them. So the recommendation is don't go in there expecting you're gonna find perishables. The grocery stores that don't have power to fuel their refrigerated areas will still have the non-perishables. Um, they've given away the perishable items and the ones that do have perishables probably have already run out or running out. So, but in terms of broader, um, broader more broadly the supply chain they're fine the port is not open yet uh, but for example with the the fuel they're getting it through trucks um, we're not in a situation where we are going to run out of food or where um, it is just impossible for fuel to get to Harris County in the event of a serious emergency um, so just a note here before I move on, this isn't the first time uh, and, and certainly it won't be the last time that we have to go through a hurricane season or something, uh, some sort of event in which we are without some of uh, access to some of those necessities. And so let's use this as a reminder. Once we're past the discomfort um, of this uh, time without power, once our homes are repaired, just remember to have provisions for seven days. And every time during hurricane season, that your tank is half full, picture it that, that the halfway point is the empty line in hurricane season. You always wanna keep it over um, half full. So, uh, so, you know, sometimes we don't take those recommendations seriously. We figure we'll be okay, but that'll make it so much more comfortable if, if this happens again. So here's some good news. President Biden's been trying to send aid. Uh, really, he uh, directly and his administration have been reaching out to myself and to the mayor um, since yesterday, asking how they can help, very much leaning forward, very much pushing for us to be able to receive what we need. And um, that really is how they've always treated Harris County. And uh, I've had, um, had a couple uh, pretty thorough conversations with the president this morning and the way it works is 
the, the federal government needs the state government to issue a request before they can grant the request. And so, as we know, Governor Abbott has been on an important economic trip in Asia, and so we had not received that request. Well, we, we found out that it was possible for the acting governor, lieutenant governor, to be able to send it, um, you know, because Governor Abbott's not acting governor right now, so he couldn't do it. So, so Lieutenant Governor um, sent that request out this morning. As soon as that happened, um, the president was was uh, had his team also there with him, and and he just said, you know, we're gonna uh, we're gonna deal, uh, get this done immediately. And so they have approved um, certain assistance for Harris County and for the region, for the impacted counties, and I want to say for all the counties. Um, so. What does this mean? It means we can get resources more quickly from the federal government. So for example, yesterday evening, I got a call from our uh, CEO of our public hospital system. And uh, it turned out that the LBJ hospital, which is a um, key, key pillar of our healthcare infrastructure, had lost power. And not only that, but their generator had also failed. So without AC, it got so warm in the hospital that people's lives were at risk. And he had spent um, already time trying to get his hands on that second generator. They had to shut down all operating rooms except for two, which meant a lot of even emergency operations were delayed. Um, obviously impacted their ability to provide food to patients, people who were ill, to move critical medication to cooling trucks. They had to move critical medication to cooling trucks, and it impacted their ability to keep electronic medical records. Um, so fortunately, Centerpoint was able to quickly restore their power uh, several hours later but it was a window that was um, feasible for the for the hospital that it was okay it was good but we won't be able to do that in every instance and so in the event that we have another urgent situation like that one or where um, for for just physical reasons, it, it's something that can't be repaired that quickly, we can now call on the federal government to send us the kind of generators that we might need for critical um, facilities before all of the repairs are done, um, some of which are just going to take longer. So it also means as you all know, fire um, departments, police departments have been working um, around the clock on, on rescues, on um, where government agencies are going to be working on debris removal. All of that is very costly. So this will allow our various first responder agencies um, to receive reimbursements for, the, for those expenses, which will help us be better prepared for the next ones. Um, and what this also will do is it makes it more likely that we will be able to get direct financial support for the individuals affected. We don't yet have um, the exact count, which is, is the requirement uh, step we have to go through in order to receive that assistance, but I would say it's more likely than not that we'll be able to get it, especially with this attention from the president himself. Um, another piece of good news, we didn't have any water rescues overnight. As far as uh, Harris County is concerned, um, I'm not, not sure about the numbers in the city of Houston, but usually it's pretty representative. Uh, so this bodes well, generally speaking, not having to focus on, you know, somebody that uh, tried to touch a power line or didn't see a downed tree means that we can focus our resources on uh, emergencies and also the types of calls that we have seen an uptake on, which is seniors and medically fragile individuals individuals who need help. Um, and so the takeaway here is we do depend on you to help keep you safe in that sense, as I was mentioning. Just give us a call, call 211 if it's not urgent, call 911 if it is. Um, normally during power outages like these, people are used to hearing about shelters. Um, because the power loss is so extensive and there are certain steps that the Red Cross and the government have to go through to be able to open a, a, a shelter under the law, um, we don't have a shelter right now. In other words, there isn't a place where people can go and spend the night and cool off. That all sounds very scary, except for the fact that normally these uh, shelters are severely underutilized. During the derecho, we had hundreds of thousands of people without power, um, maybe a couple of people uh, visited our, our several shelters. Um, um, here and there. And so 
we it's not a major issue and um, we had the same situation during the flooding near the San Jacinto River so and as I said because we have this ability to respond to those 211 calls um, if, if it's somebody who you know they're not in an urgent need a rescue right now situation but they need a cool place to be um, they need you know whatever uh, resource um, we can provide that just reach out um, Community centers, multi-purpose centers, there are many folks in our community that are used to visiting those, whether it be in their city or um, uh, unincorporated Harris County. So many of them are not open right now because they don't have power. Um, and we do, though, have cooling centers for the daytime. So um, if you would like a cool place to be, if you need transportation there, you can also call 911. Uh, excuse me, you can also call 211 if you need transportation to one of the cooling centers. But we have 14. So those are daytime cooling centers all around the county. There are 14 between the city of Houston and uh, outside, outside the city of Houston, uh, Harris County uh, partnerships. In terms of... Uh, the the other um, answers to other questions, you know, I just want to know, want you to know, we are working with all our partners, all levels of government to move this as quickly as possible. I do recognize, though, the number one issue right now is power. And so that's why, um, first I want to share a piece of good news there. Overnight, the number of outages in Harris County went from 1.69 million to uh, 1.29 million in terms of the region 2.2 million is now down to uh, 1.68 million and so that was uh, as of noon today so by now it's four uh, the number we hope is is better and so so that is that's great i'm really grateful that center point made themselves available to give the community an update right now and answer questions so i want to facilitate them being today and um Obviously, they don't work for me, they don't report to me, but what I can do as a leader is advocate for that transparency and facilitate that conversation between the community and the power utility. So um, I really believe from my interactions uh, that everybody's operating in good faith, that everybody's working to respond as quickly as possible. And um, so I'm gonna just repeat in Spanish and then I'll give an opportunity to Paul Locke uh, and his colleague here to speak. Let me go back to my Spanish remarks. So, um, buenas tardes, estamos, yo sé, cansados, frustrados, eh, tenemos calor, todos estamos batallando a dormir y ya encima de eso eh, queremos refrescarnos, ya estamos cansados de las tormentas. Hay miembros de la comunidad que han sufrido dos o tres veces con esta, eh, entonces, en solo los últimos dos meses. Sé que que con ese calor eh, no vemos lo único. También hay árboles caídos, estamos ya haciendo las evaluaciones en las calles alrededor del condado y hemos visto esos árboles caídos en medio de los hogares, las cercas derrumbadas, eh, señales grandes caídas. En, de hecho, en nuestro estadio de NRG es, hemos incurrido daño de cercas, de varios toldos, de letreros grandes y encima de eso eh, el techo, pedazos del techo salieron volando. Entonces, eh, inclusive se ve el, el campo donde juegan, juegan fútbol americano. Eh, lo que quiero hacer es estar hacia el lado de la transparencia. Entonces, eh, voy a compartir la respuesta a la información que tengo. Eh, sé que la pregunta principal es la electricidad, entonces hemos invitado a representantes de CenterPoint para que respondan a preguntas de la prensa y también den uh, la información que ellos tienen. En cuanto tengamos más información, la vamos a compartir. Pero hay, hay esperanza, todos estamos... Eh, escuchando de familia o amigos eh, que tienen ya la luz restaurada. Yo no soy, soy, no soy una de los afortunados, pero, pero sí está mejorando la situación con la electricidad. En este momento, lo más eh, peligroso es el calor. Va a ser mucho calor esta semana. El Servicio Meteorológico Nacional ha dicho que eh, todos los días de esta semana vamos a tener avisos de calor. Entonces, recuerden eh, tomar agua, tomarse un tiempo para ir a descansar en un, en un área acondicionada, bien sea en el carro o ir a otro sitio, 
Puede sonar un poco tonto decir, ok, eh, obvio tenemos que tomar agua, pero es peligroso. Mucha gente muere anualmente por la deshidratación y ahora sin aire acondicionado, sin electricidad, se vuelve una amenaza más grande. De hecho, hace un año eh, me sentía muy mal, me dolía todo, no me podía levantar del sillón, eh, me sentía mareada. Resulta que me deshidraté por montar bicicleta afuera en el verano y no tomar suficiente agua. Entonces, estén pendientes de eso. So, al final, al, al finalmente necesitamos de su ayuda para también poderlo cuidar. Entonces, tenemos recursos disponibles. Si tiene una situación de emergencia, puede llamar al 911 como siempre. Gracias a su apoyo, no hemos tenido que hacer rescates, eh, bien sea porque alguien no evitó un árbol caído en medio de la calle o eh, estamos preocupados que de repente la gente fuera a tocar uno de los cables eléctricos que se habían caído, pero todos han sido muy responsables. Entonces, tenemos los, eh, los recursos disponibles para apoyar a personas que necesitan ayuda urgentemente. Puede también ser que usted necesita ayuda eh, dada la situación, pero no es súper urgente. Por ejemplo, eh, los hogares de personas mayores o si usted es una persona mayor o una persona con eh, la salud delicada, puede llamar al 211 y un equipo se encargará de ir a visitarlo, ver cómo está y llevarlo a un sitio donde haya aire acondicionado, ayudarle con oxígeno que necesite, diálisis, bueno, lo que sea. Entonces, eh, por favor, contáctenos al 211 si no es urgente, es, una, es un grupo de organizaciones sin ánimo de lucro, con, con mucha seguridad, con mucha confianza, puede usted llamar, eh, aunque sea inmigrante, aunque no tenga papeles, el 911 es para urgencias. Eh, en cuanto a la gasolina, sé que es, eh, no, hay, no hay mucha gasolina en el condado, eso puede causar pánico y lo que les pido es que, eh, es que tengamos eh, esa paciencia porque no hay necesidad de pánico. El puerto está cerrado todavía, pero hay eh, autobuses, hay maneras de traer gasolina al condado Harris. En este momento, el, la, la razón por la cual no hay suficiente gasolina es por eh, la electricidad. Sin esa electricidad, las gasolineras no pueden, eh, no pueden proveer la gasolina. Y aquellas que sí tienen electricidad, pues están ya quedando sin gasolina porque todo el mundo está yendo. Entonces, a, a estar tranquilos con eso, eh, si nos cuidamos bien, no hay por qué este calor nos sea de, de, de gran problema, más de el desespero. Y, y si tiene algún problema médico, nos puede contactar. Eh, si usted logra llegar al frente de la línea a una gasolinera que que si sí tenga electricidad, sea amable, solamente lleve lo que necesite. Si tiene ocho de los galones de, de, la, de gasolina, eh, no, no, no los llene todos, llene lo que necesite. En cuanto a los supermercados, están haciendo todo lo posible por ayudar. Muchos de ellos no tienen la electricidad para mantener fríos los alimentos perecederos. Entonces, eh, pero aunque ese sea el caso, tienen los alimentos eh, no perecederos. Entonces, puede visitar cualquier supermercado que esté abierto. Los que tienen alimentos perecederos y no tienen luz los están regalando. Y igual los que sí tengan luz, lo más seguro es que ya se acabaran los perecederos. Entonces, nos va a tocar acostumbrarnos un poquito a comer un poco distinto, pero no es gran cosa y, y hay, hay suficientes supermercados que sí tienen, eh, tienen lo que se necesita. Eh, es también un recordatorio, de repente un lado positivo de esto es un recordatorio de prepararnos para para esta temporada de huracanes. Durante esta temporada de huracanes debemos tener el tanque del, del automóvil al menos medio lleno. Cuando su tanque llegue a la mitad, considere como si se hubiera ya acabado y estuviera vacío y vuelva y lo llena, porque uno nunca sabe. Y tener siete días de provisiones para de comer medicina, eh, la mascota, etcétera. Otro pedazo de buenas noticias, el presidente Biden ha estado muy pendiente, hablé con él dos veces esta mañana, desde ayer nos ha estado buscando tanto a mí como al alcalde para ver cómo nos ayudan. El gobernador, como saben, está en un viaje importante económico de trabajo en Asia. Entonces, el gobernador no puede firmar eh, la, las peticiones que se requieren para que el gobierno federal nos pueda enviar ayuda. Esta mañana eh, nos dimos cuenta y logramos que el vicegobernador lo 
pudiera hacer. Entonces ya el vicegobernador eh, Patrick ha firmado eso y al minuto el presidente empujó para que nos otorgaran ese, esa ayuda. Entonces, ¿qué significa? Significa que podemos recibir recursos más rápidamente. Por ejemplo, ayer el hospital de LBJ, que es un hospital muy importante en nuestra comunidad, se quedó sin luz. El generador también falló. No tenían aire acondicionado, las vidas de los pacientes estaban en riesgo, tuvieron que sacar medicinas, eh, tuvieron que operar, eh, tuvieron que cerrar las salas de operación, solo tenían dos, entonces inclusive operaciones eh, urgentes no se pudieron llevar a cabo. Al fin, Centerpoint logró reparar lo que estaba dañado y por coincidencia, era algo fácil de reparar. Pero si no lo hubiera sido, en, en, ahora tenemos la alternativa de llamar al gobierno federal y que ellos nos envíen eh, urgentemente un generador, por ejemplo, si algo así volviera a suceder antes de que se, se termine de arreglar todos los postes de luz. Eh, también significa que las agencias públicas, policía, bomberos, etcétera, van a poder recibir reembolso eh, y también eh, pues eso los ayuda a estar mejor preparados para cualquier desastre a futuro. Eh, lo otro es que hace más posible que vayamos a recibir ayuda federal para individuos, fondos directos para las familias impactadas. Eh, hemos hablado también de los refugios en el pasado, esta vez por lo que no hay electricidad, no tenemos los refugios de los que normalmente hablamos, o sea, refugios de donde uno puede pasar toda la noche. Lo bueno es que realmente la gente no usa esos refugios mucho, ahorita durante el derecho, durante los vientos, tuvimos de repente un par de personas, eh, entonces lo que sí tenemos, como expliqué antes, es la habilidad de ir a visitarlo y ayudarlo, entonces llame al 211 si no es urgente, 911 si sí es urgente. La mayoría de nuestros centros comunitarios, centro, centros multipropósito, lugares donde normalmente pueda ir, actividades, puede que estén cerrados. Entonces, eh, bueno, lo más seguro es que ya, ya sepan cuál está cerrado, pero eh, sí les quiero decir que, que hay centros donde puede ir durante el día, más no en la noche, pero durante el día, a eh, estar un rato en aire acondicionado, eso es lo que se llama los cooling centers. Hemos establecido 14 a lo largo del condado eh, con la ayuda de la ciudad. Vamos a seguir trabajando para recibir toda la información y compartirla, pero yo sé que finalmente lo que tiene todo el mundo en la mente son los apagones. Entonces, el, anoche de 1.67 millones de apagones en Harris County estamos ya a 1.29 millones. Igual son muchísimos, pero es mejor. En la región de 2.2 millones a 1.68. Eso fue a mediodía, entonces ahora lo más seguro es que el número haya mejorado aún más. Eh, me agradezco que CenterPoint esté aquí presente para contestar preguntas. Obviamente ellos no trabajan para mí, eh, no es una oficina de gobierno, pero los quería invitar porque lo que sí puedo hacer como líder es formar esa transparencia, eh, fomentar esa conversación, facilitar, facilitar esa conversación entre la comunidad y la empresa de servicios eh, de electricidad. Entonces, eh, lo, estarán aquí respondiendo preguntas de la prensa. Por mis interacciones, basadas en las interacciones que he tenido estos días y realmente durante ya años, mi impresión es que todos están actuando de buena fe y buscan resolver esto lo más pronto posible. Entonces, vamos a invitar aquí a Paul Locke y a su eh, colega para que nos ayuden a entender cuál va a ser la situación. Uh, so, let me call up uh, Paul Locke. Thank you, Judge. Hi, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Paul Locke. I work for Centerpoint Energy as the Director of Local Government Affairs. With me is um, Michelle Hundley, who is in our Corporate Communications Group. We thought I'd start off with just giving you a quick update on what's been going on over the past couple days, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So at the, <clears throat> when the storm blew through, we lost 2.2 million customers system-wide, which is 80% of the customers we serve in the Houston region. Uh, after it blew through, we went through an assessment phase, going out, looking to see where the damage is. If you look at the number of customers that are out, it appears that Harris County was hit the hardest of all the counties we serve. We're, we plan to wrap up uh, our assessment phase tonight, and sometime, as soon as we have a, a, an estimated restoration timeline, we will release that to you. Today uh, was the first day we had over 12,000 linemen in the field working to restore power and as the judge said we've gone from 2.2 million out to 1.6 million 
So, and one thing I want to point out is whenever we have a storm like this, every Houston area center point employee has a role in helping get um, um, power back on as quickly as possible. So with that, I'll open up to questions that anyone may have. So, so typically they come, it, my understanding, they come just outside the region because we want them to be safe. Safety is our core value and we don't want them in the eye of the storm. And so, and it really doesn't matter. <clears throat> we need about, depending on the size of the storm, we need a day or two to assess before we even can uh, deploy them. Uh, we originally asked for 2,500 mutual assistance crews and then we got more. And we've got, please know that we've got 17 staging sites around the region, and uh, most of them are outside of Harris County. Do you uh, feel like you have enough manpower out there to, to get things fixed at a timeline? I don't work in operations, but, I, you know, it went from 2,500 to 11, now 12. You know, it, this is a very fluid event, and in a day or two, if we feel like we need more, We'll, we'll get more, but it, I think it's too early to answer that question. I think people, the customers are looking for reassurance right now. They're facing a second night. Oh, sure. A sweltering night. Uh, you know, they, they want to know, they want some assurance because our email went out that I was shown that said, could be days. You know, oh, it's going to be days. It's going to be days. I mean, look at, look at the last event in June. I mean, in May. We had just under a million people without power. I don't know if you recall that. We restored power to a million people in four and a half days. And, and now we're at 2.2 million. So it's, it's, I, I can't give you a timeline, but it's not going to be tomorrow. But, and, and, and look, we live here, we work here, we have employees that don't have power as well. It's miserable. Nobody, nobody wants to sleep in a uh, house that's um, 85 degrees. But on the flip side, you got to remember, Houston is the fourth large, or is one of the largest economies in the world, and, and not having power impacts that economic uh, engine. So we're motivated to get people back on as quickly as possible. When do you think that timeline is going to be available? And I think that you know, there are people who want to know: Should I just leave town and come back? And you don't know if they're going to come back on in an hour. So, so the best I, I don't know. I asked for it before I came down here. They thought they could have it today, but we, we will release it as soon as possible because, and know that it's going to be a system wide timeline. It's not going to be, we're not going to be able to break it down by county or street or region. It's going to be a system wide. Does that make sense? Like we serve from the Woodlands to Galveston and Mount Bellevue to Sealy. So it's going to be a system wide restoration timeline. I don't, uh, I heard about that. I think his, uh, I'm not sure what, I'm, I'm going to pass on that. Michelle, do you know anything about that? Yeah, I can't speak to it. I can't speak to it. What he was referring to. Okay. But so. maybe uh, you two can connect offline and get an answer. answer. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, take that. Hi. So again, I'm Michelle Hundley, um, manager of community or communications, external communications. So um, this is very similar to what we talked about during May as well. Um, so there's a couple of numbers that are on our on that information. So one number is customers affected, and then the other is outages, right? And so customers affected are individuals, outages are you know circuit wide, larger th larger um, sections, and um, so. In terms of that, some of them may be nested outages that we talked about also <laughs> in during May where um, you have one group of people that may be affected individually than other people, right? Um, and then also it's changing, it's fluctuating like Paul mentioned earlier. So 
some folks may, you know, they may, including in our assessments is also um, our cut and clear crew. So the cut and clear crew are the guys that as they're assessing the lines, they go, here's a tree, right, on this power line, and they'll come in and cut, cut and clear it, right? And sometimes just that cut and clear may cause um, some of the, the lines to be, to, you know, help re-energize and get that quicker. So the numbers are going to be fluctuating throughout the day. So like right now it might be 1.6, and in a couple hours it might be 1.9, a couple hours later it might be 1.2, right? It just depends as we continue to assess, as we continue to make our way and working and re-energizing, those numbers are going to fluctuate. Let me, can I just ask a question here in terms of um, the, why, why would it go back up mm -hmm. if it, you know, because you said 1.6, 1.9, mm -hmm. so what would cause it to go back up? And I do, yeah. I do want to know, my impression in the past has been that internally mm -hmm. you, you guys do have a sense of what's out. Um, so, mm -hmm. just want to confirm that you guys do have those numbers Absolutely. internally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So our, our internal, our internal, internal processes tell us where who's on, who's off, you know, and and we have that information. But to answer your question again, as you know, sometimes we have to de-energize in order to re-energize other sections, right? And so throughout the process, and you'll hear this from our customers as well. I had power, now I lost it again. Right? It's because we're trying to energize other sections and we have to de energize one section in order to fix the problem for another section and then re energize again. So that's really, it's just a process. It, it's, you know, that's just the way the system works and we're doing our best to re energize everyone as quickly as possible. And we really want to thank our customers because we know it's tough. It's tough out there. It's hot out there. We want to be, we, you know, thank you for your patience. Thank you for your support of all the linemen and women that are out there and the vegetation folks that are working hard. Thank you so much for your support of them, too, because they came here from other states, you know, to help us. And so, you know, any support you can give of them, we truly appreciate. The judge wants you to talk about how long they may be de-energized. So a couple hours. It depends. Yeah. But yeah. So, the, so the question is if they, you know, they're saying, that some people may have to be de-energized in order because it, for whatever mm -hmm. mechanical reason, electrical reason, you have to take them down. So I was just hearing just to confirm, um, Paul, it's not this, if you had power and they have to de-energize you in order to help the entire system, mm -hmm. it's going to be a matter of hours, not a matter of days. Oh, absolutely. No, 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 no not a matter no, of days. No, no, okay, no. so I'm hearing not a matter of days, a matter of hours. Um, yeah. I mean, look, I also don't have power, and I live in an apartment building, so to climb up the stairs yesterday after, you know, working all day, all night and working all day. So I'm, I'm not happy either. None of us are happy. Um, the sense that I get, though, as I said earlier, in, in having worked with Mr. Locke for, um, through several events is that they, they're operating in good faith. Now, I have heard some things that are concerning, and I want, I'm hoping, Paul, that you can answer this. So one of the things that I know people have heard is, well, I talked to linemen that were outside my street, uh, on my street, and they said that they'd been waiting for hours for instructions. And so that's one of the questions I had for him. Um, so, so, yeah. Okay. Well, one, I want to say thank you, Judge, for bringing that to our attention because we were not aware of that. Um, and actually, we have three examples of that. And as soon as I heard about it, I notified our senior electric uh, management team, and they weren't familiar with it, but they plan to uh, rectify that problem as soon as possible because these guys are getting paid by the hour. And they're making very good money, and it's not efficient for them to be sitting around while people are inside their house sweating. So. I've been with Centerpoint 25 years. This is the first time I've ever heard of this happening. So. What else? Yeah, I, I, would, I really want to encourage, because it's hard for us to sift through every question online, so I would really encourage um, for the press here to just whatever you guys have heard. I, I asked him earlier, do you know, I think this is different from others. Oh. Uh, from your standpoint, give the customer some reassurance. I mean, it, it sounds like we're in some three, four, or five more days. Yeah, I mean, I, I was here during Ike. Um, I was little. I was in high school, so I don't remember everything about it. It's been a minute. Um, what I do know is it took weeks sometimes. Um, during the derecho, we had talked about this might take weeks because those towers had fallen. 
in the end, Centerpoint figured out how to go around the towers so that it could be faster and it was a matter of days. Still too long, okay? Still too long. Um, I met some families, um, a young, young woman with a teeny tiny baby, um, fragile elders with serious medical issues that were coming for help. So that's why we've really worked to try to have our 211 system um, help respond, that trying to get that, that federal aid so that if it takes longer uh, to repair the home um, besides the electrical part that people can get support. What gives me hope is that we have not discussed a like, this is going to be Ike, it's going to take many weeks. Um, I don't like, for example, these stories about the linemen. I think we all believe they're true, right? We're hearing it from credible people. Um, so I don't like that there's this new situation that they've never encountered before. But I think I'm more hopeful than not because um, we're being able to bring these questions to the the company um, and, and they appear to be working on them. So, so right now, after every disaster, whether there's water in homes, whether there's no power, um, when it's miserably hot, yeah, I mean, heat makes us all angry, makes us all frustrated. Um, so we're not having a great time right now, but it, it doesn't have to be a life safety issue. We can, we can all work together on that. We have more support from the federal government. We've got 10,000 linemen that have come down. They were boots on the ground yesterday. Um, we have a company that is not in their interest to not solve this financially. Um, so I would just say to people, um, you know, hang tight with us. Don't panic. Don't panic. There's no reason to on the fuel. There's no reason to on the food. Um, and it's hard just psychologically with the heat, but I do believe we'll get there. Now, if I get the opposite sense, if it seems to me that they're dragging their feet, that they're not listening to concerns the public has, I'm gonna share that. But I have heard, for example, I think that um, some folks were saying, well, they never, they never had anyone staged, there were no crews when I, I know for a fact the crews were staged and the crews were here. So that's the kind of thing I just think, you know, we're all looking, we're all upset. Um, and what I'm trying to figure out is with a level head, parse out, are they acting in good faith? Are they not? And right now I'm on the, I'm on the first side. Um, so anyway, yeah. So what other questions do you guys have? So um, our understanding is our power alert service is, is working. Now, I'm not saying that folks aren't getting their messages. Um, I have, we need to double check on maybe there's a certain zip code because there have been telecommunication issues as well. I have a personal experience where yesterday, I, my cell phones, both my work mobile and my personal mobile, which are two different carriers, I couldn't get a call in, out, text in, out, nothing. I couldn't get Wi-Fi, I couldn't get anything. So I think there's also some telecommunications issues and some of those may play a role because PAS, Power Alert Service, comes through what the customer requests. So they may request texts, they can request a phone call, or they can request an email, right? And so if, if they're requesting phone calls and texts and their telecommunications is down, they're not gonna receive them. Same thing if they're not receiving Wi-Fi, they may not be receiving their emails, right? So I think it's, I think it's part, part of that for sure, um, but we're certainly looking into to make certain that those that are signed up for PAS are receiving their alerts. So you're not aware of the system running any problems? Not at this time, not at this time. Okay, um, also the outage map, um, obviously that's a big question. Mm -hmm. asking, you know, sure. Sure, so our outage map um, in May during the direct show, that was it, based on the number of customers that were trying to see the map, as well as third parties, vendors that were taking information from our map, basically overloaded the map, right? So we had to take it down. 
Um, and so we are working on, um, on a map that's going to be cloud-based, and it should be coming in fairly soon, probably by the end. Won't be for this particular situation, but it should be coming in the next few weeks. Um, and so, and then we're going to be work, we're also working on a final plan that will be coming later after that. But for now, this cloud-based system should be coming soon. I don't know when the next storm will hit. So, but we certainly are working on that, you know, that cloud-based system that will be coming in the next few weeks. Are you talking IT or physical? Physical. Yeah, so we filed uh, a resiliency plan with the uh, Public Utility Commission of Texas to harden our system. Uh, during the last legislative session, a law was passed requiring all companies like CenterPoint to file a plan with the Public Utility Commission of Texas to harden their system. And I think we filed a, approximately $2.1 billion plan so yeah, we're working to do it, and we're already doing it now. You may, I don't know if you've noticed some of the new polls we're putting in. Um, they look a little different. Uh, they, they have a different color to them, but uh, they're a lot sturdier. So yes, there's a plan. Okay, I, I'm glad you asked that, and I meant to cover it. So um, the first thing we do is restore power to um, critical facilities like hospitals, uh, water supply, um, places like here, uh, fire departments, police departments. We want to make sure the backbone of the region is covered. And then from there, we go and say, OK, where can we get the most customers on in the quickest amount of time? And then after that, typically what you see is <clears throat> a, a section of town where there's only two or three customers without power, and they've got five trees down, you know, on their power lines, and it's a long, difficult job. So it's priority customers, and then we're working the most on as quickly as possible. You know, I got an update just before I came down here, and that was not in it. Um, they may still be verifying. Let me turn to uh, Mark Sloan if you've heard something. No, so, so we'll verify when we get back upstairs, and we'll let you guys know. I certainly hope that's not the case. And, of course, Chief Christensen's not here, but you're uh, reminding me, and I know she's out in the field with her crews, is, um, you know, people try to run generators, and it, and it bears repeating that um, make sure that you run them well away from your home. Sometimes people put them right on the awning, and then the, the, the carbon monoxide just kind of pools and ends up uh, causing problems. Um, and so, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a big one. Safety, safety reasons, that's our core value. And I'll tell you, we handled this storm the same way we handled the storm in May, where we got almost a million customers back on in four and a half days. There's been no change in our process. And so just like the way that you were. And remember, this storm changed. It was heading towards South Texas. And even then, we were still looking to get a small number of crews, but then in 24 hours, it changed. And again, <clears throat> remember, we can't send them out until we do our assessment, because we have found it's more productive if we do the assessment and then go send them out to where the need is, otherwise than just randomly sending them out. So it's painful for a day or two, but it's more efficient in the long run, if that makes sense. Just one quick question on that, sorry. When you say they're working late, do you mean? They're, they, were in, they were outside the region okay. waiting for the storm. Okay. They were close okay. because we had some working Monday. Mm -hmm. And then we've got, now everybody's here today. So. Still a good question. On Monday night, I mean, it's like 12,000 in time right now, but on Monday night, how many people are here? 
uh, it's hard to say. It could have been a thousand. It could have been twenty five hundred. I mean, I, it was a much smaller number. I haven't heard. No. I haven't heard. The, I haven't heard that question. But what I've heard is, people get their power back on and then they lose it mm -hmm. for for whatever reason, but it eventually comes back on. That's what I've heard. But I haven't heard the telephone thing. Yep. So we don't make a difference. There is no differentiation between commercial and, and, and you know and, and residential. So Paul mentioned how we restore. So um, when we start restoring power, the way it works is kind of like an outlet, right? So we have to start with the substation, check the substation area, and then we take the substation and we go down the line out into the communities, right? Because you want to start at the source of the power and then start restoring along the line so that once you get down to the end, everyone's been restored along that, that, that line. Does that make sense? So there is no, like we don't pick and choose communities and we don't, that's not what we do. Um, we, we start the power source and we work our way out. And then back to what Paul was mentioning, as we're doing that, we find we go circuit first, right? And then we start going down to the more individualized um, sections that are um, more uh, distinct or have more issues, right? And then also we all want to remind our customers that as this restoration process continues to take a look at their weatherhead and their um, their their owned infrastructure, because even if their neighbor, like let's say their entire neighborhood is up and running and they are not, more than likely it's probably a weatherhead issue where it's their own infrastructure, they're gonna have to get it fixed themselves and then we can come back and restore them. So that's also sometimes, I know there's questions from customers who say, well, everybody across the street, you know, it has their lights on and we don't. Two reasons, they may be on a separate circuit than everyone across the street, number one. And then number two is they may have a weatherhead issue and they need to get that fixed. So there's multiple reasons for that. So number one reason is cost. So if we bury all the lines, your, your, the cost of your electricity will, will rise significantly because it takes a lot of money to bury lines, number one. And then number two, there's a pro and a con to burying lines. So if you bury lines and you also, it takes more effort to get to them when there is an issue and more cost again, right? Then, you, then it is the overhead lines, number one. Number two, we are the Bayou City, and so we have, you know, wet underground. We have a lot of, um, you know, different pipelines, utilities, things like that. We're an older city as well, so there's a lot of other infrastructure underneath that may, you know, not allow us to bury lines in certain areas of town. Um, but also, to Paul's point earlier, we did file a resiliency plan, and in that resiliency plan, we do have a plan to underground some lines that would make sense, right? Like for example, transmission lines over highways, um, where we've got in the plan that we're going to try to underground those types of lines. So where it makes sense and where it's co cost effective for the customer, we're, we're looking to bury those lines. I'll take that. We we have a list of the counties and the city's cooling centers, and they are on our priority list. And wh why the city only chose to go with one, I don't know, but they're on our pri priority list. So if they should lose power, we would be out there immediately. Okay, and let me ask 
something actually uh, I failed to mention earlier people can find the 14 cooling centers on readyharris.org and they're uh, pretty spread throughout the county as I understand including the city including the city um, near so it, I, I I mean I will see how many people come um, but I don't I I I'm quite sure that the 14 is adequate just because there are other areas where people can go and cool down throughout the day that they may want to go to besides cooling centers um, where they may be able to do an activity or whatever. Um, so anyway, we'll be we'll certainly be looking at that though and, and happy to help out the city. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I have more questions. Um, do you guys don't have any other questions for them? Okay, so I have my own list, um, Mr. Locke, if you don't mind. So one of the questions, excuse me? Oh, goodness. Yeah. Our ASL interpreter has to go to the mayor's office. Thank you. Sorry. No, thank you. Thank you so much. Oop. All right, so um, questions that our office has received. What is Centerpoint doing to get power back as quickly as possible? Anything to add on that? We've got 12,000 people here. I think that's the best we could do, and we're working 24-7. So I think we're doing everything we can do. Okay. I um, hope the mic caught that. Um, we talked about the timeline, vulnerable populations. Um, why were mutual assistance crews not staged before the storm? So I think you've clarified they were staged. No, they yeah. were outside the region. Okay. So they were outside the region, and they typically come in once the storm passes to the staging site. And remember, until we until the storm passes, we have to do we have to wait to do our assessment so that we know where to send the crews once we put them to work. Okay. Um, I think that everything else has already been asked. 